Christ understood how important it is for us to know the seriousness of hell. The words of Jesus help us to understand God's wrath in a way that we can explain these things to others. He also warned us about fake Christians. He told his disciples in Matthew chapter 7 that you would know them by their fruits. We read in verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I'm sure there were those in that crowd that really believed they were followers of Jesus. They weren't expecting him to say this. Jesus wants us to understand that in his kingdom, there are laws. Lawlessness is an attitude of contempt. It's to really hate what is in your best interest. It's sinful wickedness. In God's kingdom, he places his law within our hearts. Our good King Jesus is saying that if you're always going to go against the kingdom, I don't want you here. Now here's the thing. These people thought they were believers. They were casting out demons. They were calling him Lord. They really believed they were Christians. They knew Jesus, but their sin kept Jesus from knowing them. So he said, get out. that thought they were believers burned the Protestants at the stake. <music> History even tells us that there were very cruel masters that would whip their slaves and they thought they were believers. Now we see many today that are false teachers that claim to do miracles and they think they're believers. Just because a believer says they know Jesus doesn't mean that he knows them. It always boils down to one thing, and that is sin. Practicing lawlessness means that you're looking for ways to get good at it. Paul tells us in Romans, the first chapter, how they were doing things that were not fitting and, in fact, became inventors of evil things. If you even think about lust in your heart, it's the same as if you really did it. Jesus wants to sweep out all that junk in our lives before we end up hurting ourselves. He wants to cleanse us from all sin. He's calling us out of the world 
He wants to break the chains that bind us to sin. He's calling us to repent. He knows where this world is going. And as we look around us, we see unlimited darkness around us. We see technology infiltrating our life to the point where it drags us down into that darkness. That's why gluttony is a sin. Because we'll start to find addictions to food that will kill us. And not only that, but make us ineffective for the kingdom. Fornication is a sin because it leads to lifestyles that can involve diseases that are very dangerous and it will also make you ineffective for the kingdom. God just wants us to thrive for his kingdom. He's not trying to make life harder. He teaches us what sin is to keep us alive. Going against God's will is sin. And he doesn't just want us alive. He wants us as ambassadors of his kingdom. God's warning about sin is ultimately to keep you alive and make you effective for the kingdom. Jesus really understood how important all of this is. Even Jesus himself didn't sugarcoat the consequences of being a slave to sin. In fact, he spoke boldly and fiercely about it. Notice God's word at John chapter 8 verse 34 and 35 Jesus said whoever commits sin is a slave of it and a slave does not abide in the house forever but a son abides forever therefore if the son makes you free you shall be free indeed Jesus even went so far as to say that if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And he also said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing, gnashing of teeth. Jesus said, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. What Christ is saying is that there are temporary consequences for sin, but worse than that, there are eternal consequences for sin. Jesus wants us to hate sin as much as he does. In John's Revelation, Jesus gives a message to seven churches. Notice what he says to this one particular church. In verse 15 and 16, he says, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you're lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. In verse 19, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And then again in verse 22, he says, Whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a warning to the entire body. All who belong to the church need to repent. Although he is very compassionate towards his loyal subjects, he also has a very strong arm of justice. 
So he takes sin seriously. In fact, he expects his servants to obey. Hell was an important topic for Jesus. So let's see what we can learn about it in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. In the parable, Jesus describes a rich man, and the reason why he was so rich was because of his selfishness. He was a greedy man, and he could care less about the homeless or those less fortunate than him. Lazarus was not only poor, but he was crippled. And whenever he saw this rich man, he would beg from him, even if it was just a few crumbs. The rich man was disgusted with this beggar. One day, Lazarus died. God didn't care that he was a beggar. He sent angels and had him brought up to heaven. And there he saw Father Abraham. Then the rich man died, and even with all his fame and wealth, there were no angels to escort him to heaven. Instead, he found himself in Hades. When we study the parables of Jesus, we see that he always uses realistic or probable situations. In this parable, Jesus is helping us to understand that Lazarus was humble and that he was received into heaven and that the sinful rich man found himself in a place of torment. Then the rich man looks up and not only does he see Lazarus, this is the guy that he always ignored, but he sees that he's in a place of peace while he himself is suffering in torment. That's something to think about. Suffering in torment in hell, and then seeing all those who you wronged, who you sinned against, who you offended, living in peace and comfort. The Bible says, Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things? And likewise, Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. God wants us to understand that there are consequences for ungodly behavior. Here's an important question. How do we know when someone truly does know Jesus? Well, Jesus said that those who have a, a true relationship with God will be known 
by their fruit. Well, I think we need to make a little distinction here because we're not talking about the works like casting out demons and maybe even doing miracles. Because Jesus told those ones, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of iniquity. No, the fruit is different. It's quite natural for a believer to do good and want to please God. But the point here is that a true believer of Christ doesn't practice lawlessness. God knows his true believers through the continual work of the Holy Spirit to produce the fruitage of repentance. This is God's work of setting us apart that our life changes and we are being set apart to a new life. God gives us passages like this to give us a wake-up call, to help us to reflect upon our lives and where we are in our walk with God. So where's the fruitage that shows that we truly know God, but more importantly, that He knows us. In 1 John 3, 6, we read, Whoever abides in Him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen Him nor known Him. But now a couple of chapters earlier in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, he says, If we say that we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So those that are true believers and abide in Jesus are abiding in the sense that they confess their sins and they're not practicing sin. They're not in a constant, perpetual cycle of sin. There's a difference between those who sin and those who are masters of sin and are really good at it. In fact, they are slaves of sin. Yes, those whom God has chosen will truly abide in Him and bear good fruit. The biggest evidence that we have to show that someone is abiding in Christ is fruit. In one of Jesus' final teachings to the disciples, he explains to them, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I spoke to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Here Jesus says, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. That word prunes is literally translated cleanse or to take away filth or impurity. So what God is doing is he's nurturing us as part of the vine. He's pruning, he's cleansing us so that we would produce even more fruit. 
Holy Spirit has a way of bringing us through. And for some of us, it's a tough transition away from sin. We might even experience serious withdrawal effects, but God is there with us. Now, withdrawal symptoms do not last forever. What happens is Holy Spirit comes along and fills you up with the strength that you need to overcome the struggle. God is breaking the chains that binds us to sin. He's empowering us with His Holy Spirit to overcome sin. God notices our willingness to commit. He cleanses and empowers us with Holy Spirit and lifts us up to abide in Him. And true believers in Christ don't want to be slaves to sin. In fact, the first thing we should be thinking about is fleeing from sin. Whatever it is, cut it off. Run away from it and don't look back. Get rid of all traces of it. Get it out of your house. Get it out of your life. The thing is not to give your body easy access to sin. This means you're going to have to deal with withdrawal. When you're trapped in the addiction of sin and you don't experience any withdrawal symptoms, it means that you truly have not cut it off. You will definitely feel withdrawal symptoms when you flee from your sin. You may have to flee from something that you are constantly looking at on your device. You may have to flee from substances that you're used to taking into your body. Fleeing means to stop clicking and looking at those things. Fleeing means that you don't hang out with those type of people. If we're fleeing from gluttony, we may have to avoid certain foods that are bad for our health. You can suffer from withdrawals when you stop sugar. That should tell you something. You might get a headache or some flu-like symptoms. Uh, you may end up convulsing with muscle spasms. You might get grouchy or irritable. You may even go into a deep depression. Withdrawal from sin can get bad. But when you're committed to fleeing your sin, God will help us to give us the ability to endure because we know that withdrawal is only temporary. But also, we can follow God's Word. We can study how Christ was warning us. When we follow Jesus, we're leaving this old world behind. When it starts getting hard and you're suffering through withdrawals, open your Bible. Learn what Jesus said about hell. Remind yourself that he is a king and that he will settle accounts with his servants. And what happened to those servants that didn't follow the will of the master? We need reminders of why we are in the fight against sin. Studying God's work reminds us of the serious nature of sin, and it's these reminders that give us endurance until the period of withdrawal has ended. Now, don't just flee from sin, and don't just follow God's word. No, you 
flee your sin. You follow God's word and you fix your mind on Jesus. This means getting your mind out of the world and into the kingdom. The Bible tells us to set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. God makes it possible for us to replace sinful thinking and you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to flood our minds with the kingdom to wash out any kind of content that leads to sinful thinking. And we can do this by putting on the mind of Christ by watching content that tells us about God's kingdom and Jesus, by opening our Bibles and filling our mind with the Word of God, by memorizing Bible scripture. All of these ways help us to take off the sinful thinking and put on the mind of Christ. There's a huge difference between worshiping your device and using your device to worship God. Watching sermon videos and doing Bible studies using the Bible app on your phone. These are all great ways of using your device to worship God. There's great content out there that'll fire you up for God. King Solomon understood when he wrote the proverb, Since they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. Yes, but there's another fruit, and that is the fruit of the Spirit. And that is the good fruit. You see, you are what you eat. Garbage in garbage out. You see, God's call to repentance is one that bears fruit. That fruitage is shown by how your life changes. As change takes place, we need to keep an eye out for what it is that God has called us to become, the role that He has chosen for us to serve your entire life can change in a way where you have a whole new perspective. Just look at the story of the prodigal son. There was a man that gave his son all of his inheritance, and that son got so excited that he ran off and squandered it on all these things of life. Then he hit rock bottom. And when he hit rock bottom, he came to his senses. And what did he do? He repented. So he turned from his wicked lifestyle and went back home. And thinking that he would be punished, his father showed joy in receiving him back. This parable helps us to understand how much God loves you and that when we return to him, we repent. He doesn't push you away. He opens his arms and wraps them around you. When you find yourself knee deep in sin constantly over and over again, Listen to your Heavenly Father, because He's calling you. He's calling you to come back home. And just like that prodigal son, He's going to run out to you and show you how much He loves you. True believers refuse to be slaves to sin. They never give up. They don't throw in the towel. As true believers, we hear God calling, and we're going to fight the flesh. Come before our King and repent.